please make sure you're wearing your mask. Thank you. <clears throat> Welcome to the October 14th work session of our first in-person meeting of the Prince George's County Board of Education. For over a year now, uh, we've been uh, operating virtually, and it's good to see some faces today. Before we begin, I would like to ask everyone to talk, turn off any wireless devices uh, to avoid any technical interference with the microphones and taping of the meeting. A Spanish call-in line for the community to call to hear the meeting interpreted live has been established. The number is 508-924-5000. Five, five. Again, the number is 508-924-5155. Closed captioning should be available through live YouTube streaming for the deaf and hard of hearing community. For those who are not able to observe now, this meeting is being recorded and information will be on our board web page. Now, I'd like to have the roll call, Ms. Ellis. Mrs. Adam Stafford. Here. Press the button. Here. Mrs. Ahmed. Here. Mrs. Here. 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 Mr. Harris. Here. Ms. Mrs. McKenzie. Here. Mr. Montero. Here. Mr. Murray. Mrs. Paul. Present. Mr. Thomas. Present. Mr. Valentine. Here. Mrs. Williams. Happy to be here. Oh God, we pray to administer that which is just in all educational policies, being ever mindful of your guidance. Steer us to action with love, wisdom, and understanding. Amen. Amen. We all stand, please. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America. For which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Second. Present. Aye. Aye. So moved.
It has been moved and second that we approve the minutes for September 23rd, 2021. We have a, a, a motion on the floor. It has been second and no discussion and hearing none. All those in favor? Aye. 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 I'd like to do roll call so that it will be on record who's in attendance and who's not. Ms. Ellis? Ms. Aye. 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 Mr. Saron Ruiz. Aye. Mr. Harris. Aye. Mrs. Mickens Murray. Aye. Mr. Murray. I'm sorry, Mr. Montero. Aye. Mr. Murray. Mrs. Queen. Aye. Mr. Thomas. Aye. Mr. Valentine. Aye. Mrs. Williams. Yes. Dr. Here. Here. Now we will move into a point of personal privilege. This evening I have the distinct honor of giving recognition to one of our own Prince George's County's finest. <clears throat> and we are calling it the this year's Hall of Fame induction ceremony. Oh no, this is wrong. <laughs> we are we're here to acknowledge Ms. Danielle Gittin, Gittins, the owner of Brewington Management Company, Limited Liability Corporation, and a career Prince George's County Public Schools alum. Her interest in engineering and construction was evidenced during her formative years when she was accepted into the Oxen Hill High School of Science and Technology program with a concentration in agriculture, architecture, engineering. She then went on to attend and graduate from the University of Maryland College Park with a Bachelor of Science in Civil Engineering Construction Management. As a professional civil engineer, Ms. Giddens has managed numerous construction projects in Maryland and Virginia. Most recently, she has led her company to manage all three sites of the University of Maryland Medical System, University of Maryland Capital Region Health. The University of Maryland Capital Region Health National Harbor opened on July 20th, I mean, in July 2020. The University of Maryland Capital Region Medical Center just recently opened on June 8th, 2021. And the University of Maryland Laurel expected to open in fall 2022. She is the epitome of a Prince George's County proud. Please join me in welcoming and presenting Ms. Giddens this award of recognition for her outstanding leadership as construction project manager for the new University of Maryland medical system here in Prince George's County. Ms. Giddens.
Thank you, thank you, thank you. And we have one other point of personal privilege from our school board representative, uh, or student school board <laughs> representative, our board member, Saron Ruiz. Yes, thank you, Madam Chair. And so I wanted to raise two points um, at this time. Firstly, I wanted to acknowledge um, Indigenous Peoples Day that happened this past Monday and acknowledge the Akakik, Patuxent, Piscataway, and the other natives that stood in this very district. Um, I think that it's very important in this public forum to actually address it. Um, secondly, I wanted to invite all students to the inaugural PGCPS Hispanic Heritage Fest happening tomorrow, Friday, October 15th from 3 to 5 p.m. at Ellen Roosevelt High School. As, and join us as we celebrate the rich culture that is my Hispanic heritage and to celebrate the American Latino community. Um, it was initially open to only high school students and as some interest grew, we are now opening to middle school students and pre-registration is required. And so that could be found on the PGCPS social media page and also in my Instagram page at alvaro.saronrees. And I highly encourage all students to come participate and invite your friends, cousins, whatever it may be, and join us as we celebrate with Spanish music, resources, giveaways, and just all that good stuff as we close out Hispanic Heritage Month. Thank you. Thank you, Board Member Ruiz. Now we will move into our public comment. Uh, we have seven registered public comment speakers this evening. Uh, t well, it's three now. Uh, first on the agenda will be the Honorable Joanne Benson, Maryland State Senator for the 24th Legislative District. And her issue is Prince George's County Public Schools Board Matters. Senator Benson. Turn that microphone on, please. Thank you so much. Appreciate it very much. Thank you, thank you, thank you. <clears throat> Good evening, Madam Chair, members of the school board, uh, to the wonderful, wonderful CEO. Good evening, everybody. I'm going to need your undivided attention. I want your undivided attention. I don't want you to do anything. I want you to do only the one thing I want you to do is breathe. <clears throat> now, before I get started, I want to disclose that I am not here to speak for the senators. I'm not here to speak for the delegates. I'm not here to speak for anybody but Joanne C. Benson. Now, let me say this. I'm going to speak until I sit down. Why? Because I've got miles to go, promises to keep before I sleep. This is needed, this speech here tonight, this conversation is needed tonight from someone who knows this school system. I know this school system like I know the back of my hand. I've served in just about every capacity that you can imagine in this school system. I love the Prince George's County Public Schools. As a 36 year cancer survivor, I just want you all to know that this young lady standing up here and my oncologist who graduated from Duval High School are among the reasons why I am here tonight. Around 1970, a group of us went to Fredericksburg, Virginia. We rented a bus to go to Fredericksburg. We stayed in a hotel for two days, talking about how we were going to deal with the integration of the Prince George's County Public Schools. How were we going to meet the challenge of diversity? Because you see, at that time, the racial composition for brown and black children was just about 10%. Floyd Wilson, Cora Rice, Stephen Ruth Brown, Linwood Jones, Clem and Barbara Martin, 
John Spearman, Joel Parker, Nathaniel Exum, Joanne C. Benson, Sarah McKinney Love, Teresa Bank, Dr. Al Thornton, and the list goes on and on. Now, why am I calling these names? These are the warriors whose names I just called are responsible for most of you sitting up here. Tonight, I am speaking on behalf of 133,000 rising stars. I'm speaking for the 14,000 workers, principals, teachers, custodians, bus drivers, secretaries, supervisors, aides, assistants, nurses, mechanics, painters, electricians, and the list goes on and on. These are the people who work every day to take care of our beloved children. And on their behalf, I want you to know, school board members, we are all profoundly displeased with what is going on here at the school board. I've been waiting for someone to come here to tell you what you need to hear and what you need to do. What better person than Joanne C. Benson? I spent over 45 years of my life working to create a world-class, first-class school system here in Prince George's County. We've changed superintendents. We change chairs of the board like you change your clothes. Unacceptable, unacceptable. Each time this happens, there's a problem, a change in the staff, a change in the teachers, a change in expectations, which puts the school system in a willy-nilly position, slowing down the process and the progress of our children. When we conversed with educators on the State Board of Education, this is why I'm here, their response is, we have viewed the school board meetings, we've looked at the school board members, and it is abundantly clear to us that the board is not focused on children's education. Now that was the last straw. Do you think those of us who have spent countless hours, some of us stay, look, I can remember a time when this crowd that I just named sat in Coral Rice's basement and we started out like six and seven o'clock in the evening and when we looked up, it was daybreak the next morning. Do you think that we are going to sit around and allow this foolishness to continue? Absolutely not. We're not going to have it. We're not going to have it. Now, I want you all to know, I came here alone tonight, but guess what? I'm prepared to take the second step. Don't you forget it. And I say what I mean, and I mean what I say. Now, those of us who love the school system, stayed up all night long in meetings, should never sit by and let this embarrassment and foolishness continue. Absolutely not. Do you realize how hard it is for us in Annapolis, the senators, the delegates, and guess what? In Annapolis, we are not in love with each other. But when it comes to the school system and when it comes to Prince George's County, we put all of that aside. And if they don't, I talk to them. Put that nonsense aside. The job for us to educate our children is bigger than all of us. We have sent back $2.8 billion, not to mention the other grants and all the other money that you are receiving. We can't do that down in Annapolis. And we don't do it with peace and quiet. Sometimes we do have to raise our voice, but we understand what the agenda is. And we're not going to continue to, to, to have this disruption in the school system. Do you also realize that we have our children? That's why I'm here. That's why I'm in Annapolis. People keep saying, Senator Vincent, when are you leaving? I'm going to leave when I'm 104 years old, so don't forget it. If I'm not in Annapolis, I'm going to be doing something for children. Because that's what the Lord has anointed me to do. 
and I want you to understand that I get a joy out of doing it. Now, your actions on this board, your behavior on this board is getting in the way of our plan for excellence in our school system. I can't even go to my local grocery store. I shop at Giants over in Largo. I've had to stop shopping there because it takes me two and three hours to get there and get out of there. Because everybody walks up and says, Senator Benson, what are you going to do with that disruptive school board? And guess what? It is all over this county. It's all over this state. People are talking about the school board. We don't deserve it, my wonderful friends. I'm telling y'all, I'm telling you. They even call names of people on this board. They say, Senator Benson, what are you going to do about it? You know what? You better be thankful that I can't do something about it. Because if I could, something would happen. But I don't have that authority. Now, I don't put any of you on the school board. I can't take any of you off the school board. But if I could, I would. Lay you out in the process. Now, <clears throat> I'm not interested in foolishness. That's my favorite expression, no foolishness, which leads to parents who are not willing to send their children to our schools because of what they see and what they hear. Some of the best and the brightest educators in this country, in this world, are working in our schools. And they are working under stress, they're working under strain, but what you do on the board is casting a dark shadow over what they are able to accomplish with our children. The pandemic has not helped us because of the absence of broadband and other circumstances. We have a superintendent born in Prince George's County, raised in Prince George's County, graduated from schools in Prince George's County, understands children, Everybody in, in the state of Maryland, everybody all over the place talking about our superintendent and how wonderful she is, how sharp she is. And then she has good sense to surround herself with some of the best and the brightest. And we got this foolishness going on the school board? Please! Please! We have, a super, we have only one superintendent. None of you up there is the superintendent. Don't forget it. Don't let me have to write you a note or come back here and tell you, hey, you're not the superintendent. Don't run over that superintendent. Don't disrespect that superintendent. We are not going to allow it to happen. I don't care if you like it, if you don't like it. And I don't care if you don't like me. God loves me and that's enough. Now, let's meet, let me hurry up and get out of here. I'm going to ask you to review your role as a school board member. I'm not going to be running back and forth because I have 120,000 people that I need to take care of. We just had a terrible tragedy in my district. I spent this morning trying to work with those senior citizens at Gateway who just experienced trauma. I've got children that need coats and shoes and food. I need people whose rent needs to be paid. I need people who, need, who I have people who need a job. That's what I'm doing. I'm not running back and forth down here. I'm not going to do it, but I've got a second plan. I'm not going to talk to you all about it anymore. I'm going to come down here today with my quiet voice to tell you that it's unacceptable. I can tell you this, for the sake of our children and our school system, I don't mind coming back. I don't mind coming back to call names. No clicks. We don't have time for that. No nonsense. We, as taxpayers, lovers of our children, lovers of the school system, confidence in our school system that produces some of the best and the, bright, best and the brightest in the world are looking for an immediate change. You better, you, I'm not asking you, look, you have to do some soul searching. You have to determine whether or not you're operating in the best interest of our children. Our children, our future, somebody who may possibly have to take care of you one of these days. And 
You all are acting up up here? Uh-uh. No. You, some of y'all better stop following the leader here because you're going to get in trouble. And I really mean that thing. As sure as I'm going to heaven. I'm going to heaven. None of y'all in here can stop me. Now, we don't want to continue seeing the unprofessional behavior displayed, which is the talk of the county, the state, and the country. Our school system deserves better, and that's what we're looking for. Put the focus where it belongs, not on personal agendas. If you have personal agendas, then you need to take it somewhere else, not here. We're not going to continue to have our reputation. When people move to Prince George's County, they ask two questions. How good are your school system, is your school system, and how safe are your communities? And when they look at the school system and understand the behavior of the school board, they're not going to send their children to the schools. When, hey, y'all, get a grip. We can't have it. We can't have it. And that doesn't mean I don't love you, but I have to tell you exactly like it is. I was waiting for somebody else to do it, but I said, no. I talked to the Lord about it. I'm going, I'm going right on down there to tell him. Now, listen, put the focus where it belongs, not on personal agendas but on those things that will raise the bar above the realm for our children so that we can enjoy the kind of school system that we know we can have. People are wealthy. People have the resources to do what needs to be done. We have all kinds of organizations that want to work with our children. We have parents who want to say, I have a next door neighbor, Senator Benson. I'm ready to send my children to school but are you watching the school board's behavior? Yes, I am. But I can't watch all of it because I have to turn it off. Because I love my television. I paid a whole lot of money for it. I don't want to have to get up and throw a chair and hit my television. They're not, my television is not responsible. Listen here. Listen here, y'all. I'm through. I'm through. We need a world-class, first-class school system. You all have the folks that can do it. And, the, and these people will tell you, if they don't do what they're supposed to do, the, the CEO hears from me, some of these people in this room hear from me, sometimes I call them, they don't answer their phone, I take names. If they don't answer the second or third time, I'm coming down here. I'm going to where they are, and then I will act out. When I call, I want to respond. It's never about Joanne Benson. This is not, this conversation is not about me. You all know my age. I'm 40 times two. And one of these days, I won't be able to stand here. But while I'm standing, and the good Lord is giving me the breath to breathe, I'm going to say to you all what you don't want to hear but what you need to hear. I'm not out for fluff, glitz, and glitter. Someone said to me, well, Senator Vince, if you go down there with the kind of speech that you anticipate, you may not win in 2022. Let me straighten you out on that. If I never win another race, I have run this race with patience. And I know the Lord is pleased with me. And if I don't win, it's his plan. He's got another plan for Joanne C. Benson. So I want you all to understand that I'm not afraid of nothing and nobody because I live right, I do right, I treat people right. If someone calls me in Annapolis or any place else, I try to do what I can to help. And that's why I'm here tonight. I'm here to help you. Now, I'm telling you all, listen carefully to Joanne Benson. Step one, plan one. Madam Chair, you are the chair. We're supporting you. Madam Vice Chair, you're the Vice Chair. We're supporting you. But you all have to work together. We're in this boat together. And we're either gonna sink or swim. I'm not gonna be a part of the sinking ground. We got to swim along and get along. It's not about love. We're not in, we don't have to be in love. I'm down in the Navajo with some people, I really, Really, if I could, I don't want to tell y'all what I do. <laughs> but 
but that has nothing to do with it. I'm asking the school board, cut that foolishness out. Cut the nonsense out. Focus on your job description. You're not the superintendent. Don't run over the superintendent. You're not the chair. Yeah, the chair may get on your nerve, but guess what? You get on her nerve. You all better work together, I'm telling y'all. This is part one. I have a, ch I belong to a church with 16,000 members. I've already talked to my pastor. I have a 202 coalition with over 1,000 members. All I have to do is make one phone call, y'all, and this crowd will be in here like nobody's business. That's not what I'm after. I'm after you doing the right thing for the good of our children for future generations. I've got miles to go and promises to keep before I sleep. And I'm gonna keep my promise for the good of this school system and for good for the good of our children. Now you may not have liked what I said, but I want you all to know that before I put a pencil on a piece of paper, I don't know what your religious background is, but I talked to the Lord about it. And I can't, I, guess what? He told me what I needed to say and I said exactly if you don't like it, talk to him. Cut the nonsense out. Cut the foolishness out. All of you in here. Because we are professional grown folks. Let's do it. Let's get the job done. And if you all need me for anything, for the French, let, let me go on record and say this. As for the school system, I will get out of my bed 2 o'clock in the morning, 3 o'clock in the morning, 4 o'clock in the morning to come down here to help you with children, but not with any knowledge. I'm, I'm just not going to do it. But I will, I will help you in any way that I possibly can. I am prepared to do it. I'm going to tell you right now, I don't, go, I don't get up a day in this world without praying for this school system. I pray for this for the CEO and you every day, for the people who are in the truth every day. And sometimes I stop what I'm doing and the Lord and I are there together and I do a little shout. Yes, I shout. Yes, I do. But I want you all to know that I love you. You can hold it against me, it's okay. But I came down here to do what I said I was going to do. And that's to say to you, cut it out. We don't have a moment to wait. May the Lord continue to bless you with good health and strength. And all of you in this room, I want to thank you for what you do for children. I want to thank you for every word that you say that's encouraging to children. I was a former school principal, and I'm still dealing with knuckleheads that came to John Bain Elementary School. They come and ask me for the craziest thing. But some of them have been very successful. Some of them come back and say, thank you, Ms. Benson. Thank you for what you did for me. I didn't like you then, but I love you now. That's the attitude that I display. I'm not asking you all to love me, but I'm asking you to respect what I say and please adhere to what I have said to you tonight. You be abundantly blessed. Take care of your health. But let's think about our children and put all the foolishness, all the personal agendas aside and let's move this agenda. We've got miles to go, promises to keep, before we sleep. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Benson. Now we will. Putting up with me tonight. Behave yourself. One last thing. Behave yourself. Stay out of trouble. If you get into any trouble, I do not know you. <laughs> Thank you again, Senator Benson. Now we will con continue with our registered public comment speakers. As a reminder, you have been registered to speak in public comment forum where the Board of Education will listen to your comments. The board will not address your comments. All registered speakers will have three minutes to make their presentation. Registered speakers may not relinquish any part of their speaking time to another registered or unregistered individual. Speakers may not address individuals or issues with profanity or derogatory terms. 
you will be warned once. If you continue, your comments will be muted and you may be removed from the meeting. Speakers are encouraged to use titles rather than names. For example, principal, CEO, deputy superintendent, etc. Your adherence to these guidelines will enable the public participation process to move smoothly. Now we will have our, our next um, comment speaker, Mr. Lawrence Weaver, Global Justice Solutions, presentation of online dispute resolution platform for school use. Mr. Weaver. Greetings board and Madam Superintendent. On behalf of the Global Justice Solutions, I thank you for allowing me the time and attention to present to you a product free of charge we think could assist your educational system. For reference, I come, with, come to you with a 25 plus year work experience as a probation officer with minors and advocating on behalf of the often underserved population in this area. A fellow Prince George's County resident, a product of the Prince George's County school system and college graduate. Let me give you a few buzz terms. Bullying, school SROs, labor disputes, gender tolerance, diversity, miscommunication, and the all too familiar school to prison pipeline for which I see you have a future agenda item. I believe what we have to offer can assist you in these departments. As such, I'm here to offer you a product free of charge, trailblazing and the first of its kind. We are extending an online dispute resolution platform to give your top 25 school district a more streamlined, accountable, and expedited response time in the vein of restorative justice. It is a platform we are extending to you as a pilot program for what we hope to make the national model for the school-based dispute resolution. So who are we? Global Justice Solutions believes that the advent of new technologies like cloud computing, cloud computing and social media platforms have changed the way we do business. Innovation is at the forefront of our company strategy and we work hard to bring in new technologies and innovative solutions. We take pride in delivering solutions that provide the best customer service to our customers, and we believe that in customer service lies success. So what is it? Odri is a secured cloud-based multi-party platform that provides online dispute resolution, allowing all entities to resolve disputes in a timely and accountable manner. It empowers schools to transition from the traditional process, often mired in wasted time and man hours, to improve access to expedited outcomes. School cases can be managed in a simple, quick, inexpensive, accessible way leading to improved efficiency and less backlog. The platform itself is to be used to help resolve disputes between parents, students, employees, school districts, and even unions. As a frame of reference, the base platform we have deployed and for some time is in California Superior Courts has have been a resounding success and we now want to apply this model at a school level. What we are giving you is an easily accessible platform without the need for headache of creating Zoom or Microsoft Room Teams, easy access for all users, provide a platform with a responsive process, and allows the assistance of licensed mediators internally and externally to resolve conflicts. This information could be used for statistical data purposes that in turn would offer return to your investment to state offices with respect to progress within your school system with tangible data to support and endorse school policy and wait for it budget appropriation in return always the ask is for your feedback and time and on behalf of global justice solutions please contact us for a live demo of what we are offering you and we thank you for this opportunity thank you mr weaver our next registered speaker is mike kravitz individual ieps and special education good evening uh, my son, Josh, is 15, he just started, uh, as in last week, just started ninth grade at a non-public school here in the county because he's not capable of attending a traditional classroom setting. He returned home to us in mid-August after two years of residential behavioral health treatment. Let me say that again. He had not set foot in our house since May 2019 before anyone had ever heard of COVID. He was in multiple residential facilities for kids with psychological disorders after hiding weapons in his bedroom and threatening to kill everyone in our house. It's a lot to unpack and I'm happy to do so with anybody later. But with that background, I'll get to my point. 
When we knew Josh would be discharged from his facility, my wife and I immediately reached out to the CIEP office to determine where Josh should attend school. It was determined that PGCPS did not organically have the ability to meet his needs. Today, he is still not enrolled in a school that can meet his needs as agreed, agreed upon in his IEP, and I'll explain that. We were told by the CIEP office that it was policy that they only applied to one non-public school at a time. Here's the problem. Each application takes anywhere from two to five weeks, and we're currently waiting on a response from our third school. Joshua was enrolled last week in a school that we and the CIEP office know cannot meet his needs. He was enrolled in a school as a checkbox in a weak attempt to meet his right to free and appropriate public education while we await application results. And that's questionable at best given, as I've stated, the team agreed that his current placement does not meet his needs or his IEP. One more time, Josh is currently enrolled in a school that the county has agreed cannot meet his IEP because policy only allows for one application at a time. And frankly, that's messed up. Now, despite our best efforts, which include emailing uh, senior members of the special education office, the CEO, our district seven board member, no one has produced this policy. Frankly, no one has responded to any of our emails at all about why we can't submit more than one application at a time and why we have to wait such an unreasonably long amount of time to get our son into an appropriate placement. Instead, we're being strung along over some made up policy no one could explain. It's not grounded in any sort of code or AP, but it's impacting our lives. And I, 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 I will reiterate some of the words of the, uh, the distinguished uh, senator who I don't see right now, uh, but stop fighting as a board and get to work fixing the broken parts of this bureaucracy and start fulfilling your basic fiduciary obligations to meet students' rights to a free and appropriate public education. It's about priorities. Nobody on this side of the bench cares about your internal drama and dysfunction. We care about you working for our kids. It's unacceptable. Thank you. Our next speaker is Lorena Shaw. I don't see her present. Madam Chair, I'll return the chair. Thank you, Madam uh, Vice Chair. We also have written testimony from community members that have been posted on board docs. Please review the testimony at your convenience. Now we will go into work session discussion topics. I will now yield the floor to Dr. Goldson for an introduction of item 4.1 under the work session discussion topic, mitigating interrupted instruction caused by the pandemic. Thank you. Good evening. As we begin to recover from the pandemic and continue to address the needs of the Prince George's County Public School community in new ways during the 2021-2022 school year, we look forward to the opportunity to reimagine the possibilities and how we will serve all students through an equity-centered learning recovery process. An equity-centered learning recovery approach acknowledges that the pandemic has impacted each of our students' lives in many different ways and provides a systematic plan to support academic learning, social emotional learning and learning recovery that diversifies resources and efforts across the spectrum of student needs. Reimagining the possibilities means providing comprehensive support for the recovery of learning for students that were academically impacted by time out of school or challenges participating in distance learning. At the same time, this approach acknowledges and works to advance the real life gains in flexibility self-motivation and technology skills that many students acquired throughout virtual learning and hybrid learning. Underpinning all efforts is a constant priority on social well-being and awareness of mental health and wellness. Now it gives me great pleasure to introduce three team members, Dr. Judy White, Dr. Doug Strader, and Dr. Helen Coley, 
who will walk you through what we're doing to mitigate interrupted instruction caused by the pandemic. Thank you. So good evening, I'll begin. Board Chair Miller, Vice Chair Williams, other distinguished what, members of the board. One second, um, Dr. Strait, if we can pull up the PowerPoint presentation, please. That's fine. Thank you. Presentation. And we will begin on slide three, I'm yep, sure. That's it right there. Thank, Thank you. you. So again, Board Chair Miller, Vice Chair Williams, and other distinguished members of the board, it's my pleasure to be here in person this evening to kick off this presentation for you all. Much of the content which is gonna be shared with you momentarily by Dr. White in particular and, and Dr. Coley uh, is about um, to link directly to our new strategic plan, which is titled Transformation 2026, also known as in short, the T26 plan. So I wish to take some time and provide a formal introduction to this plan. A hard copy of the uh, plan has been placed on each of your workstations. It's wonderful to be back in person. So why is this plan needed now? Our formal plan, Great by Choice, sunsetted in the close of the 2019-2020 school year. So it's now time to reflect and reset our priorities. This is increasing complexity of our environment due to the pandemic and other natures have caused this sense of urgency for change. Again, the global pandemic has forced change by shattering longstanding paradigms and given license to, if not forced, creativity and innovation within our wonderful district. Our environment has given rise to the opportunity to reimagine public education and take our place as leaders in defining and modeling its transformation. Common theme here. We own the responsibility to equip our students to not only meet the challenges, but to responsibly influence their futures in the midst of this unprecedented social, political, technological, and economic change. So PGCPS is poised for a transformative future with strong leadership, high effective educators, relevant instructional models, student center supports, an equity focused culture, as well as a technologically relevant instructional institutional delivery system. So how was this plan developed? The effort began pre-pandemic during the early part of the 2019-20 school year. Focus groups were created, surveys administered, interviews conducted, data analyzed, and culminating discussions occurred involving thousands, literally thousands of stakeholders, including many of you personally, uh, as well as school leaders, instructional staff, non-instructional staff, community members, and students. Drafts of the plan, in particular the strategic framework, which we're gonna review in a second, was published for comment. The final draft was then created and released for the first time publicly during the School Leadership Institute for our principals this past summer. So what was the outcome of this process? The document itself. We now have a document that differs from most traditional annual reporting plans that many of you may have experienced, either in this world of education or in some other business entity, and that is, addresses three primary questions. Where are we intending to go as a district? How will we get there? As well as, how will we know when we have arrived at our destinations? This plan is also a strong, has a strong equity focus. It operationalizes the Board of Education Policy 0101, titled the Education Equity, by deliberately addressing inequities in education, illumined by the global pandemic, as well as our social political climates that we are all living in. The plan provides the structure for the collection and interpretation of the data to reveal blind spots and inform collaborative thinking and setting the course and vision for PGCPS. Let's take a look at the framework. I want to now open the document itself and share the key components of the plan. A visual representing the key components of the plan can be found on page 14 and is also projected up here on the screen above. This visual is referred to as the PGC, PGCPS strategic framework. At the top of the framework, you begin with PGCPS's vision, mission, and core values, which are the compass by which all of our actions are guided. 
These are then followed by the four aspirational goals, which describe the desired outcomes of transformation and serve as the guideposts for PGCPS by which priorities will be set and progress will be monitored and reported. Throughout the planning process, stakeholders shared, research reinforced, and empirical data analysis supported the strengths, priorities, challenges, and opportunities that must be priorities of PGCPS to achieve its vision of transformation. These priorities are categorized within the five strategic imperatives and that bottom third of the framework itself. The final piece of the framework, which I wish to highlight, are the equity-based critical success indicators. These are the actual metrics that will help us to identify our targets and measure our success in achieving them. So this was a quick introduction to the T26 plan. If you have questions, the document itself includes in-depth summaries of each of the components that I've just shared. I believe that you will find this very different in both look and feel and structure and content from what has been in place before by either this district or any other. As an example, the focus, if you look at the bottom left and the first strategic imperative, and pretty much every document you'll see regarding any type of school performance plan, improvement plan, strategic plan, you'll see referenced academic excellence, academic performance. And this plan, we're referencing academic innovation. So again, the key to the success of this plan and what we hope for and the outcome of this plan is to measure our success in transformation. If you have any questions, please do not hesitate to contact us through the proper channels, of course. Uh, we're very excited about the implementation of the plan. With that said, I would now like to introduce reimagining the possibilities, both authored and presented by Dr. Judy White in the Division of Curriculum Instruction. Dr. White has embraced the spirit of this new strategic plan, and you will see evidence of such throughout her presentation. So thank you very much for your time, Dr. White. Good evening, board members. It is a pleasure to be here with you this evening when I have an opportunity to talk to you about reimagining the possibilities. When we talk about reimagining the possibilities, that's not only for our students, but it's for our staff as well as we start to think about how we can change and how we can be different. The quote here you'll read from our CEO is that we're trying to utilize this opportunity and use of funds to look at a new PGCPS and not go back to the old way. I think we would all agree that with the pandemic, the one thing that it brought us was the key word that she said, an opportunity. You see, it's easy to stay the same. It's easy to be on the same course. It's only when we go into chaos and we have struggle that we have an opportunity to make a difference for our children and to look at things a different way. As Dr. Strader said, we really took time to think about the initiatives that we have in front of us and how they align to this new strategic plan. So we wanted to make sure that our kids had an opportunity to experience educational excellence and excellence in equity and workforce and operational excellence and an increased awareness of mental health and wellness in learning. So on this slide, what you'll have before you, and I know you've already seen the presentation, is for the items that's in the other document that was attached to the board notes, was our reimagining the possibility document. It goes into detail and just wanted you to see how we aligned each of those strategies or actions to our new strategic plan. So let's take a look at goal number one, educational excellence. And I'm gonna talk through a couple just to kind of give you some highlights of where we are. So when we talk about using student data to drive instructional decisions, last year in the middle of the pandemic, while we had data sources available to us, we know that our instruction looked different. For example, we introduced a new benchmark system in our district. We are excited about that benchmark system. Before last school year, it took us an entire year to build out all the assessments in reading and mathematics for that system. Those assessments were aligned to our curriculum 
And the platform that we use is the platform that our students will engage in on MCAP, which is critical because they won't have to wait till May. Unlike any other district in Maryland, we were the only one that utilized that system. But lo and behold, we went into a pandemic. So the assessments that we built to directly align to our curriculum really didn't align when we got into a pandemic and instruction looked different. So we're excited this year to have that as a data source. We're also excited this year to make sure that we can realize where our students are in instruction and that we have many formative assessments in place to allow us to make instructional decisions along the way. One of the things that we've put into our curriculums this year is a WOW Wednesday for our elementary and for our middle and high schools, that will be an engagement with their teachers at least once every two weeks. In that opportunity, we're trying to make sure that our students have an opportunity to meet with their teachers and to do one of four things, to revisit, review, revise, or re-engage in instruction. It's a way that we take time to work with students for them to know and understand their data, for them to be able to speak about their data, to know what changes they need to make as a result of their data, and for them to have additional opportunities to re-engage in work that the teacher identifies that they're having problems or that they're struggling. I'm going to come back to tutoring at the end because I'm going to take you on a road and a journey through our interventions and our tutoring. So I'm going to move to Canvas learning management system. So right now, our, our teachers have an opportunity to use one of two platforms this year. They're either using Google Classroom or they're using our Canvas, management, uh, Canvas learning management system. So far this year, we have over 5,000 individual courses already in our Canvas system. We have about, four, uh, about 44,000 students already engaging in our Canvas system. We will spend the remainder of this year training the additional teachers in our system on our Canvas learning management system as next year, July 1, when we start, all of our teachers will be in Canvas. While we used Google Classroom in the middle of the pandemic and other platforms, we knew that we didn't want to come and mandate that an immediate change this year because you can't keep putting initiative on top of initiative on top of initiative in the middle of crisis. But we did an um, opportunity where we grabbed any teacher who was interested to pilot so that we could work out the kinks, work it out. Our curriculum team spent time creating at elementary, middle, and high school for every single content an exemplar course for our teachers to look at utilize and understand how we built out. We've done professional development in the spring and in the summer for all teachers that are interested and we will continue to do that all year long so that our teachers are prepared as we enter into next year. Our academic team is also committed to doing modules for the remainder of this year to constantly curate curriculum content that our teachers can pull from as they build out their Canvas courses in the next year. The reason that's important is that we just went one-to-one. -one. So remember, we're building out and we're reimagining what it can look like. That becomes important because that device should not be the device that you pick up only to open up and do an assignment, or that you pick up only at home because you have to go find your textbook. But we want to work with our teachers to utilize those devices in class to really think about in a classroom how they can work in whole group with everyone, but then how they can assign students who need additional support work through their Canvas platform while also pulling another small group in the classroom. So in a Canvas course, we want to build it out so that we have exemplars in every single module of instruction, an assessment, a video, a presentation, an assignment, images, and the opportunity for students to discuss and dialogue one with each other and also with their teacher. Then you see we have updating all curricula with a focus on integrated technology tools and strategic differentiation. That becomes relevant because when we went out in the pandemic, while we know curriculum, it didn't mean that even my staff knew and understood technology. So it was a heavy lift to make sure that not only we learned, but that we put in our, our teachers in a position to learn and to win. So we went back into our curriculums and began to take a lot of the platforms and built lessons for them. We took some of the technology and did lessons. We've done training with our T3 teams to really help them 
just uh, be unique and different in how they instruct, no longer standing in front of children and just giving information and giving overload of information, but how do we take the tools and really integrate them in a way that students are excited about learning and they have an opportunity to create through the um, digital platforms that we provide. And so I'm gonna come back to tutoring. I did not forget, I'm gonna come back. But what I wanna show you, and you will hear me talk about this every time I come before you or in any audience that you may see me talking about, is that in the middle of creating a strategic plan, we also wanted to create the academic journey. If you break this academic journey apart, you will have two documents, our student learner profile and our instructional framework. So while some of these concepts are clearly things that we've talked about, we wanted to be in a position where we normalize it across this school system. The why, obvious, our students. The how is what take place, takes place every day in our classrooms. So I wanna just spend a couple of minutes talking about the why. We know that we want our students to leave our district a certain way. It can not only be about the academics that we put in front of them, but we must focus on the character when they leave. And so that means that we must create a student who is a global citizen, one that understands the diversity of the world, has awareness about cultures around them, can be an advocate of social justice and just any change, both locally and globally. We know that we wanna create communicators, students who can read, write, listen, students who can communicate and talk to any group, students who can stand up and not be afraid or ashamed to speak their truth. We know that we want critical thinkers, students who can think through, who can reason, and who can put together and figure out problems. We know that we want creators and innovators, children who are curious about life and wanting to seek new opportunities. And lastly, we want to create goal-directed learners. We did that in a pandemic more than ever before. We created students who could show us executive functioning. But we want students to take ownership of their work. We want our students to be able to lead conferences with their parents and their teachers. We want students to be able to challenge our teachers to say, I don't understand and I wanna learn more. And we wanna put our students in a position to have choice. The how we get there is what takes place in our classroom in the four areas that you see that we will spend time with, um, with our teachers, is curriculum implementation. You'll see a culture in a community, in our schools, in our classrooms, in our central office, and how we engage with our schools. The learning experiences that they will see every single day. Not sometimes, but that they will experience every single day. And then the assessment and reflection because we've already talked about data being relevant and that data helps us know how to go back to the classroom and how to reteach. So I wanted to give you a couple of examples and I talked about this briefly, but I really wanted you to understand why I'm showing these two examples. Reading and mathematics are the gateway for our children. For a very long time in our district, we operated, especially at our elementary level, looking at breaking apart words for students, sight words for students, really focused on DRA and a lot of old um, antiquated practices. We've had an opportunity in the middle of the um, pandemic to really engage, like other districts around us, in the science of reading. So we have revamped our primary elementary literacy program. We have focused on ways in which we're training our teachers to engage with students so that reading comes um, earlier for our students and so that we're closing a gap at a younger age. We've spent time going back into our curriculum documents, making sure they're updated, because one of the things we know we've already talked about, putting a lot on teachers in new initiatives creates a lot of just stress. But how we naturally did a lot of these things is automatically built it within what they teach every single day. For those of you that don't know, we are one of the few districts in the state of Maryland that creates our own curriculum. It is very robust, it has been audited, and we ensure that all of the pieces our teachers need are explicitly written for them and are there. 
In the area of mathematics, we spent a lot of time before. We used to want our math teachers to be able to take standards, put them together, make meaning from it, and for their teachers to build out lessons. And what we learned in the pandemic is that we took time to go in in elementary, middle, and high school and provided our teachers with presentations of lessons for every content or every standard or major concept in all of our curriculums in mathematics. They've done the videos for the teachers so they don't have to do it. We don't want our teachers going to any website grabbing content because we need content to be at the grade level standard. So we created that for them. In our mathematics curriculums, we also put in QR codes so that when a teacher gets to a content that they are unfamiliar with, if they scan the QR code, someone is right there in a video telling them what the focus is and how they need to do it. So we spent a lot of time in these two curriculums, reading language arts and mathematics, trying to make sure that we can put in extra supports to close the gap. The other thing that you will see here is discourse. We have to get our students talking. When they talk, they reason. When they work with each other, they challenge each other. We want them to let them know there's more than one path and avenue to get there. So now, I'm about to take you on a journey. The next couple of slides could be very overwhelming, so I'm gonna to talk to you about them first because I'm gonna talk first about interventions and then you'll see me go into talking about tutoring systemically. So imagine we're in a classroom. Every student is gonna get tier one instruction. That means I'm gonna teach every single student on grade level, regardless of where they are, on grade level, and we call that tier one. Every student is at a place of acceleration, regardless of how they walk in the door, because every single student should have access to on grade level instruction. So if you think of tier one being in the center, we can go to the right or we can go to the left. If we go to the right, a student who's on tier one, understands it, may have an opportunity for extension. A student who's on the right, understands it, and it may be extended, could be extended further with more acceleration. But now let's look at the other side of that. Student coming in who has to have access to tier one, grade level instruction, but I'm lost, I'm, I have a couple of gaps, not really sure. We have an opportunity to do intervention. And then a student who may get intervention, but there's still some significant gaps and they need the touch of a teacher could move again for, inter, for um, tutoring with a direct individual. So what I'm about to show you are some slides on where we decided to use some of our funds to purchase interventions for our students as we talk about closing the gap. Now remember I talked about we use data. So when our students are in classrooms and our teachers are doing those data points all the time, they quickly see where some gaps exist. We made sure that the interventions we purchased were aligned to um, our Maryland Every Student Succeeds Act. They have tiered interventions based on research and evidence-based. Why is that important? Evidence-based means that it's been tried and true, that it's been out there and that school districts have used it and it has worked. Our goal was to pick um, interventions that were either a tier one or a tier two, because if we're gonna use them, we want to ensure that they work. So you, I'm gonna show you some interventions. I'm gonna show you interventions at each grade span. And I want you to know that even in our middle and high schools, while you'll see interventions, we were also mindful of picking interventions that were appropriate for a grade level. And what do I mean by that? If you're in eighth grade, but potentially on a sixth grade level, I'm not gonna give you an intervention that I would give to a sixth grader in an elementary school. I need a high interest intervention that's appropriate for you as an eighth grader, but in an adaptive system that spirals back to get you where you are and move you up to where you need to be. That was relevant for us, especially as we have students at our high school and middle school that were struggling. The other thing I will say about our interventions that you will not see on this chart is that our interventions, our um, content staff have worked with our teachers so that they know when to apply them. Every intervention isn't for every student. Interventions are picked specifically on where certain gaps exist and where certain gaps live. The other thing just for you to know is that a part of Maryland law is that we have to do a universal screener 
for all of our students in grades K, one and two in the area of reading. And for each student for our district that flags in one of the four areas as at risk automatically goes into an intervention, specifically addressing parts of the bill. So specifically addressing decoding and making meaning and breaking words apart. So we have been very strategic in what we've purchased. But I gave you all of that first, because if I start showing you the charts, you'll see, see what I mean. So I just want to show you here, you'll see the instructional supports for our elementary um, English language arts. And I'll give you a chance to look at them. Again, what we provided you is the impact, because remember I said that each one has a different purpose. A, one that you probably hear a lot is Book Nook. That's been an intervention that we were able to utilize in the summer for our students and last year, and we'll also have again this year. Our elementary mathematics, I'm sure one that you've heard uh, frequently, is Dreambox. We have an opportunity to extend that to more grades this year and to really get our students involved. Middle school mathematics. The one that I would definitely point out is Speak Agent, and it's for our ESOL students, especially in the area of mathematics, because we know with our ESOL students, we want to make sure they have an opportunity to speak right reading writing listening and speaking and this product allows them to really make gains as they're learning the content middle school reading language arts and for the second year in a row we've finally been able to do a systemic approach to high school so for our 9th, 10th, 11th, and 12th graders, we have achieved 3,000 tier one intervention to make sure that we're in a position to close the gap. Mathematics, Carnegie Learning, tier one. For our students in Algebra one and Geometry where we know that we need to close some gaps. And then in Science, because we could not leave them out, our students need to be hands on. They need to have an opportunity to see phenomena and it allows them to do just that and so we're excited that we had an opportunity to get um, that critical thinking and that creator and that innovator and some interve interventions for those classrooms as well. And then I just wanted to provide you um, with what we're doing K-12, Newzella, Learning A to Z for Esau, but I specifically want you to see Tutor Me. So I'm sure a lot of you heard over the last year and a half, parents saying, I really need tutoring support. My student really needs help with homework. My student really had some gaps and doesn't understand the assignment. Tutor Me is a platform that we have for every single student in our district, 24 seven, and in all the languages we have. So especially for our immersion programs, we now have a platform where even our immersion students can receive assistance 24 hours a day, seven days a week. So we are ecstatic about this opportunity because we know our teachers are not available 24 7 but we know our students could potentially need assistance and our parents some of them are only able to help their students in the evenings and this provides that side-by-side -side assistance so now let me talk about special education because i didn't want to leave them out you've heard me point out esau and i want to just let you see that as well as special education as well we're also providing some instructional intervention supports for them now let's move to tutoring so one of the things that we have in the tutoring grant an opportunity to have certain programs that will only touch students who are showing the most significant gaps so as you can imagine that is a lot we talked about data i'm going to keep coming back to data because for each of these programs we can't just open it up and say sign up for each of these programs, we have to take the student population that we chose, and then we have to pull the data source, and then we have to work with our schools to only send home information to the schools who first meet the criteria. It is only after we have provided all those parents with significant amount of time to sign up and the seats are left that we will then open it up to other students in that population. So I'm sure you can imagine all the detail that must go into identifying students for our tutoring opportunities, but it's necessary 
because our tutoring opportunities should be based on the neediest population. The other thing to note that as a part of grant funds, there are times when our tutoring can only be a one to four ratio. So I want to say that because when you look at the number of students that systemically, that doesn't mean that individual schools don't have tutoring funds, um, but when you think systemically, you might say an elementary, wow, only 10,000. But you have to remember if we're doing one to four, then the other part of the funds go to our teachers, paying our teachers, training our teachers, we pay them for that. We pay our teachers to plan. And then we take the students and we take them through a cycle. So this type of tutoring isn't the tutor me, where I have homework needs, I need assistance, I call in, I get help, I'm on about, well, she made my day, I got it, I understand, I'm in it to win it. This is students where we're gonna work with them over a series or a cycle of time. So these students, it might be 20 students at one time, they're gonna go through a six week window, then we're gonna grab the next 20, and then we're gonna grab the next 20, and then we're gonna grab the next 20. That is why you don't see us say, we're touching 50,000 students. It's why on here you might see 10,000 students because we wanna make sure that we're giving them the adequate touch to change instruction. And here's our tutoring for grades four through 12. Same thing, the um, opportunities that we've used on here, again, tier one, tier two. And again, when you see 17,000 students, we've also picked populations. So when you see Achieve 3000, and while we may have Achieve 3000 for every high school student in reading language arts, we're only gonna target our ninth and 10th grade in a tutoring touch with a teacher. We know that we have to get to our students early before we start accelerating them into other grades. So now you've said, I know you're sitting there thinking, wow, so many interventions in tutoring. The other thing that comes with grant funds is we have to monitor. It is no point as a school system to purchase all of these things and not take time to identify what will work and what didn't. It is our financial responsibility to make sure that we're putting the funds where we need to. So Catch On is one of the products that we use. It will tell us our usage. It will tell us how often. It will tell us what schools. And so we want, to, we want you to know that we're gonna have a monitoring plan in place. The other thing is that we're working with every single vendor that we have to find out what the growth charts look like, the growth measures look like. And we'll be working with our Department of Accountability to make sure that we're capturing our pre and post data for our students that are in our tutoring program so that we can see where growth was made and how much growth was made. So now on to goal two, that was a lot, I know. I know y'all wanna breathe, you're like, you didn't say it so much. But that's what happens when you're talking about um, educational excellence, it comes with a lot. And we're committed to making sure that our students have the absolute best. So now we're gonna go into goal two, excellence in equity. And I put this in here because while you know this, I really want to bring home to you a couple of things about summer. So while we realized and knew that summer school was necessary, we pushed for summer school. We were excited for the first time to bring that many little scholars back into a building. We also know that we didn't have as many scholars come that we had scheduled for, rightfully so. Parents still being worried about students coming into the building. And so even with Book Nook, for example, as a district, we paid for 14,000 licenses. So I say this to you because you will get parent calls that says, I didn't get an opportunity. We paid for 14,000 licenses and only had 8,000 students enrolled in Book Nook in the summer. Granted, students were tired, we were tired. <laughs> so I understand that, but I wanted you to just understand that we put these things in place for our students there are things available for our students, but just because we had them in place, we advertised every which way we could, doesn't mean that they're always gonna utilize what we put before them. Um, our summer school data will be coming out soon as we have to report it out to the state and I will make sure that Dr. Golson has that data upon receiving it. 
Then I want you to remember, we talked about critical skills and we did a bridging learning guides this year again, making sure that we took time to bridge the critical skills that you would have needed. So we call them power standards. Like what do you really, really, really need to know? Like what's the gateway from one course to the next? And we made sure that we did a very intensive three week introduction to our students in every core content class on the gateway for three weeks from one grade to the next. And then the other thing is that not only do we have our digital tools in our schools, that means absolutely nothing if our parents are not aware of the digital tools that we have for them and that they can utilize with their students. So we made sure that on our websites that we explain to our parents all the digital tools. Um, we're working to make sure um, our T3 team has videos on those digital tools so that parents understand. We know that our parents may have more than one child in a home and different teachers using different things we need to not only put our teachers in a position to win, our students in positions to win, but our parents and our community members who engage with our students as well. Goal three, workforce and operational excellence. The only way that we will be successful in goal one and goal two is to make sure that our teaching core has every opportunity to engage in pedagogy, to engage in professional development, to learn more about their craft, more about their curriculum. Our staff has done extensive office hours. We will continue to do extensive office hours and drop-ins for our teachers, and we will continue to provide professional development as, they, as needed to make sure that they know how to go through the curriculum, that they know how to build lesson plans, that they know how to continually work with our students who are at home and in school at the same time. That's our obligation to put them in a position to understand what's expected of them every single day. We will help them with their data. We will help our schools with our collaborative planning process. We will make sure that our teachers have the necessary tools. So then now we had a literacy plan and many of you remember that literacy plan because you were here. If you think back or if, if you weren't aware, when we originally started our literacy plan, we had created um, argumentative writing for our students, analytical writing opportunities that sat outside of our curriculums, specifically in our middle schools and our high schools. That writing curriculum, over time, we got better. So where it used to sit out, a teacher would have to stop teaching the curriculum to go into writing. We now naturally have built those um, tasks into our documents. So now it's a fluid process. Now we're in 2.0. This time we're calling it Digital Literacy Plan 2.0. Our new plan allows us to address reading, writing, listening, and speaking. It also allows us to address critical thinking and reasoning. And lastly, it will allow us to address um, digital literacy. The new plan is broken out when you have an opportunity to see it. It is broken out by grade level it is broken out by what the teachers will do, what the students will do, what the administrators will do. We also have a companion document on what our parents will do and our community members will do. It is a very nice hands-on document. Remember, I said we don't want a lot of new initiatives. So know that for our teachers, everything we put in that literacy plan, we built into our curriculum. But this plan will allow them to understand what reading and writing must look like in kindergarten, what it must look like in first grade, all the way up the continuum. And that's for every single strategy focus all the way up to grade 12. The other thing, if you did not know, we have a four-year special education plan and we just created a five-year ESOL plan. Why? Because we have gaps in both special education and ESOL where we have about 27,000 ESOL students and 17,000 special education students, we want them equally, because we've talked about equity, to have the best educational process planned for them. So we put plans in place to allow us to monitor what we're doing, to reevaluate what we're doing and how we're doing it and how we're doing it with community partners to assist us. And now I have the honor to turn this over for goal four to my colleague, Dr. Helen Coley. Thank you, Dr. White. Good evening, everyone. 
It is my pleasure to be here this evening with you to share this great work that we are doing specifically around goal four. Our work in the Division of School Support and Leadership and in the Department of Student Services is guided by and grounded in goal four, specifically increase awareness of mental health support. We recognize with all of the things that Dr. White just shared, that in order for, thank you, in order for each to be done successfully, we have to ensure that our students, our staff, and our families alike are well. So in doing so, I'd like to share with you specifically some of the strategies and activities that have occurred to date. Specifically, we have recognized the need for increasing the knowledge of what social emotional learning is, what mental health awareness means, and how specifically we need to support that work. We have increased opportunities for learning specifically around socially and emotionally supportive school and work environments. We are continuing to support the well-being of our staff, lifelong learners through the provision of the areas that have been provided. We're including parents in this training and activities to create supportive home environments. Many of our parents during the last months have said to us, candidly, I need support. I need to know how to support my child. I need support myself in learning how to effectively do this because they, like we, want the very best for their students and promote as well academic excellence for their children. In doing so on the next slide, I'd like to share with you some of the mental health supports that I'm proud to share with you that have and are occurring. Before going further, I wanna take you back to specifically what it says in goal four, increased awareness of mental health and wellness, increased. Many of us have engaged in conversation specific to, excuse me, mental health support and exactly what that means. We recognize that and we wanted to be extremely explicit in providing for our three groups, our parents, staff, and our students alike. I also would like to share with you that this work is grounded. With goal four, there are also five imperatives that are included within the strategic plan as well. And the imperative that we have chosen to support the work of what we are intending and have been doing, specific to goal four, is around branding and promoting access to PGCPS mental health and wellness supports. They go hand in hand. The goal is the big picture. The imperative is what we have to commit to do as well in order that we achieve that goal. Some of the things that have occurred to date, we have expanded mental health support to 140 clinicians in, our, in 144 schools. I'm happy to share with you this evening that in our middle schools, in our K-8 schools, in our high schools, there is a clinician assigned to them. We have our community schools as well where mental health supports are provided in those schools. We have professional learning opportunities for school staff on building trauma-sensitive schools, suicide prevention, and mental health. Integration of social-emotional learning into the curriculum is paramount, and our professional school counselors, during their delivery and lessons provided to classrooms and to students, are addressing areas specific to social-emotional learning. We also had the provision of small group sessions. Those small group sessions are for our students on post-traumatic stress, supporting their peers, and certainly suicide awareness and prevention. The next slides, what they do is they, they provide specific supports that we are providing from the Division of Student Services, Department of Student Services, within each category for our students, for our staff, and for our families. 
We are providing deliberate training and educational opportunities, counseling supports, and resources. On each of these slides, you can specifically see the work that we are engaging in currently, and I want to add to what Dr. White referenced a few moments ago. While we can have all of these great things here, if we don't monitor them to see if in fact that what we have on a piece of paper is actually occurring, that's ongoing. The Associate Superintendent of Student Services and I, we meet often to talk about where we are specifically in these areas. I'm very happy with, to share with you as well, we have a program that's new this year called EverFi. And with EverFi, it is only for eighth grade students. That's where we're beginning. It does not mean that that's where we will end, but it is certainly where we are beginning, where students are provided support on safe environments. Now, middle school is that area where we all know. It's kind of like stuck in the middle is commonly referred to as being. But we want to make sure that our students are having ex successful experiences in middle school on top of all of the social emotional development that is occurring for them. So these slides share with you specifically what is occurring. I want you to understand, as I've indicated, that it is not just for students. It is across the levels for different groups of individuals in support of this need. And we definitely recognize in the absence of us implementing these things that we have here as intended, we will not have the academic excellence and opportunities for students to excel as was described by Dr. White. That concludes my portion. It's clear, it's within the document, it's across the different levels. I'm open to share with you, have additional dialogue with anyone that is in need of additional information specific to each. But I certainly did not go, want to go column by column and read to you specifically what each column entails. Keeping in mind as well that in many of the columns you will see that what is done for a parent is also some of the same and one of the same resources that we're too providing for our students and our staff. The word, the language, the discussions in our schools now, no one is absent from understanding the importance of the deliverables as they have been provided to address social, emotional learning and the mental health awareness for all of our students, staff, and parents alike. Thank you. This concludes our presentation. Thank you. Dr. Golson and team, I must say that was the most impressive, innovative plan that a system could have and present. It's, it's, it sets the tone and it can be the role model for other jurisdictions to follow. I thank you for the, I'm sure you put a lot, a lot of work and sweat into providing this document. And um, I, any, does it, would any of my colleagues like to add on to the compliment? Uh, board member Ahmed. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I wanted to uh, say that I'm really glad that we're using the science of reading moving forward. And I also wanted to particularly uh, thank Board Member Murray because I know that he initiated a Science of Reading work group on behalf of this board that we all voted to support. Um, and to see this, this coming through, it really means that we're trying to um, implement what um, is being heard and what, what the research shows is being effective. So I appreciate the, that effort. Um, I did notice on um, one of the slides that you had noted uh, a literacy plan, an ESOL plan, and a special education plan. I just wanted to ask, ask as a follow-up item that those be provided to the board. Um, and particularly, what I'm interested in, you all know this is, this is like my baby, um, making sure that as many of the English language learner focused work group recommendations um, that came out, that those be incorporated as best as possible as we're going through and, and trying to um, 
mitigate the inter interrupted instruction uh, for our school district. And so I know that a lot of those recommendations are meant to be phased over multiple years, but as many as we can do as possible, as soon as possible to support students, um, I would greatly appreciate that. But thank you so much for this in-depth presentation. Um, I'm also impressed, um, and I thank you for the work that you're putting in. And That's one of the all. things, when, when we did the um, ESOL plan, one of the things we did was take the recommendations and we did a crosswalk of every year, every everything we put in a plan to what, which um, recommendation that came out of your work group, did it accomplish, which one was missing, and is there something that we're struggling with, how we're gonna do? So we've done that whole crosswalk, but I'll make sure that those documents are provided. That's amazing, thank you, Dr. White. Thank you, board member Adam um, Nickens-Murray. Uh, Dr. Golston and team, I'm extremely impressed with the plan, but I'm more interested in the outcomes, and I'm truly interested in the monitoring. But before I get there, I want to know, since we're starting and we're supposed to get all of this money from Curran and the blueprint for education, I don't know what it's called, but that's what I'm calling it tonight. Do you need staff? Because if you're going to monitor all of this, someone has to do that work. And I'm not sure that it's fair for it to fall on staff that you already have. So what I would be interested in is you come back to this board with what you need, and I'm not just talking about teachers. I'm also talking about principals. I think principals need some help monitoring that budget as this money comes in because somebody has to be accountable for those dollars. And I'm not talking about just at the uh, school-based level. The money has to roll up, guys, and we're accountable for it, and we must demonstrate that we have made progress. And then finally, the two conferences that I have attended focus totally on excellence and equity. So I'm also interested in how are you going to report out to this board? And I'm hoping something quarterly, and if that's too fast because you guys just put your plan in place, let me know when we should start. But I think eventually it should be quarterly, and we should know what, who these cohort of, of children are that are benefiting from this program. I did a quick math. We have 133,000 students, that's what I've been told, and we're dealing, the programs that were outlined was 27,000. Now I realize that we have some kids that are on grade level doing all the great things that they're supposed to do, but we also have some children that may not be quite focused on what they need to do and might need to be encouraged. And then you're doing a lot with technology, and I realize that at some point, some children don't learn that well with technology and they need hands-on. And my time is up, but I thank you for the plan. Board members, board member Adam Stafford and then board member uh, Kenneth Harris. Yes, thank you, Madam Chair. And thank you, Dr. White, Dr. Goldson, and Dr. Coley for the excellent and amazing presentation that we just heard. I just had a few questions, just some follow-up items here. Um, I was really happy to see the expansion of clinicians in schools, and I know that part of the budget amendment, I think my colleague uh, Burroughs and uh, Harris, I believe, put forward around providing more funding for mental health support. I was just really happy to see that, uh, because that's certainly something that folks in my community have asked for. Um, I wanted to see if there uh, were going to be any specific uh, emphasis on restorative practices. I did see a, a lot of support around trauma-informed instruction and, and providing uh, that type of professional development, um, but if that is also going to be folded in. Um, I was very appreciative to read the uh, qualitative descriptors that we saw in the report, and I was also wondering if we would receive uh, some quantitative uh, goals and descriptives as well uh, that would go along with uh, the report that we've read today. Um, and then, you know, lastly, I was encouraged to see the new literacy plan. And I know that in our Academic Achievement Committee, uh, we're having an intense focus on literacy throughout this year. Um, that's something that's near and dear to my heart. And I wanted to know, um, specifically along the lines of academic innovations around literacy, uh, would you all be considering some varied instructional models like project-based or mastery-based learning in order to uh, provide literacy access for all students. But again, thank you again for this great presentation. Board Member Harris. 
Yeah, good evening, everyone. Um, first off, thank you so much to Dr. Golson and her staff for putting together a very um, thorough presentation. Just want to give you all your flowers um, for all the work that you're doing for our county. Um, so thank you for that. Um, and a special shout out to Dr. White, specifically for the goals that you went over. I had one question in particular um, as it relates to tutoring specifically. Um, you mentioned that uh, you know we do a lot of advertising around making sure our tutoring programs are utilized. And you said about 8,000 of the 14,000 licenses that we purchased were used. So my question is what happens to those remaining unused licenses? Absolutely, yeah. so you know I, I, co I count coins. So oh, yeah. I made sure that they rolled the other 8,000 over into this year. Okay, perfect, yep. perfect. Thank you, and thank you again. Board Member Queen. Thank you so much, Madam Chair. Um, I just want to say, you guys, I'm not gonna lie, you lost me. It took too long, a lot of talking and ADHD. My mind was everywhere, but it, it does really seem like a good plan. Um, I do believe if you fail the um, plan, then you plan to fail. Um, and if you really want to wish, you got to have a goal for that wish. But I just have a question because as I went back and as you were talking and I was looking, um, I noticed we had one for 2021 and 22. So I just want to know, did we reach the goals for that? Because I hear you guys with this new plan, all good and well, but I didn't hear anybody say this is what happened in 2021 and 2022. I believe as I was trying to keep myself busy because I have to, or otherwise you lose my attention, um, with goals number one in our 2021 and 22 was educational excellence. Did we reach that? Goal number two was um, excellence in equity. And goal number three was workforce and operation equity. Did we do them things with the plan that we originally had before we go into this next plan? So I'm really curious to know, have we done these things? And then last but not least, what I say is, um, I love your plan and all, but I just want you guys to remember that, that we have students of all different diverse and we got to make sure there's a lot of creative and hands on. The computers are fine. And I'm telling you, um, I have to say, as you know, being a grandparent and having kids in school, I love the, all the different online technologies that they can use on hand. But even in class, as I listened to something my granddaughter said today about a math teacher, we got to be a little bit more creative with these kids and make them be able to have, make learning fun. The same thing sometimes I say up here to my board colleagues that we have to realize you got to be diverse. You got to realize that you got to empathize, sympathize, and you got to understand that everybody is not going to be drill sergeants. Some people like to have a little love and a little bit of fun and be a little bit more engaged. So we must remember that we have a diverse set of students. And I hear when you say you're going to put them all in at all level, but I'm really scared that with the different tiers that we're talking about, that you may lose that person who's not at tier one um, because you're trying to force them in it because they, then they may be like, okay, I can't get it, I'm done, you know? So I'm really concerned about that. And I'm sorry, I said that was last, but it was something that one of my colleagues said, I think board member Mika Murray said, um, yeah, you may need staff, but I'm be honest with you, I don't think we need to spend any more money on staff. I really want us to invest our money in educating and on our children. I want it to be used more so really to be honest with you on the education of our kids. I just believe we have been a school system that have spent a lot of money already on staff. It have to be other ways. Um, I don't even care if it's nonprofit or other organization that can keep a track of whatever. But as far as investing more money from the current commission and staff, I really want most of that money to be used hands on toward our students and our scholars. Thank you so very much. Board member. Um, I need her to answer a question. Oh, I'm sorry. The question about we're the last one. I'm writing them all down and then we'll provide follow up. Huh? I'm writing them all down and we'll provide follow up. Okay, I appreciate it. Thank you, Dr. Gosa. Is that it? Board member uh, Pam. Uh, thank you so much, Chair Miller, and uh, thank you, Dr. White and team and Dr. Goldson for this excellent presentation. Um, it's absolutely moving in the direction of the educational equity policy, and um, I'm very uh, proud of, of PGCPS and this work and where we're headed. Um, a couple questions I have is when we were talking about student identification, the educational equity policy starts with the, the framework of adverse childhood experiences. And there's the tool of the ACEs score. Um, and I don't, I was curious to know if we're at a point where it is, if we are allowed to, to ask those questions and use the ACEs 
score tool for even deeper identification of the students in need. And I know that in the trauma-informed teaching that we often ask the employees to, to do that, to score. And it reveals a lot of information. And um, I'm, curi I'm just curious to know some of the, I would guess there might be some privacy legalities around that that I would be interested to know where that's headed for our school system and others for how important this has become. Um, on a more uh, sort of in the, in, you know, diving into just one very specific thing, many questions, but I'll just add this one for tonight. The Canvas program, the students who are using it now in real time, is there opportunity for real time feedback? Um, I'm beginning to hear from parents that their students are, are getting used to this new system and um, how are they able to express express if they're feeling overwhelmed in it or they're having difficulties with it is there already a real-time feedback loop for for those students so I'll, I'll just stop stop there thank you Thank you, and again, uh, thank you, uh, Dr. Golson, uh, Dr. White, um, and your staff on, again, an excellent presentation. I just wanted to follow up um, on my colleague, Ahmed's point around um, this idea of, I think we've referred to it as a science of reading. I was moderating a panel about this and was corrected, and they, they call it science-informed um, reading, and so the science is informing um, how instruction is happening, pedagogy, and, and the like, and so, um, the D.C. Reading Clinic, woman named of Mary Clayman, who uh, is doing excellent work in Washington, D.C., um, Dr. Grant, who's the interim state superintendent in Ferry, but I think they, they could be really good partners for us to collaborate on what they're doing. Um, actually, when I interviewed her, she was actually in a, in a school building working with um, some reading teachers. I know uh, our colleague, uh, Board, Board Murray, knows a lot about this, what's happening in the district. And so uh, I just want us to be collaborative. You look at the data on, on how well D.C has made gains, particularly for um, low-income and minority students. It's a national story, um, but I think we can collaborate to understand how they're going about science-informed um, uh, reading uh, and working with uh, those specialists who are deployed to school building. What she said in the conversation that even in Washington, D.C., they still can use more um, instruction, more support for teachers, and so to some of our colleagues about staffing it is going to take people who are not necessarily teaching and reading but those who are overseeing and supporting those reading teachers in the buildings with research with support with curriculum um and with all the innovation that comes with it and so i reiterate uh what my colleague Dick mickens murray said uh just give us a framework for what it's what it's going to take um because i believe uh like a lot of members have said since i've been on the board um reading is at the foundation of obviously literacy but also mathematics you can't if you can't read the math problem um it's, it's pretty hard even if you have a natural skill in that so i just want to reiterate that um and also just sort of double down on um, how we collaborate with our colleagues across the across the uh, the river uh and really ensuring this dc reading clinic mary claim and dr grant others are doing an excellent job thank you board member uh Saron ruiz Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I did also want to start by thanking Dr. Goldstein and her team for the amazing presentation um, and the focus on this issue. I think if we say that learning loss isn't real, that it didn't happen, that our students weren't impacted, we are lying to ourselves. And so I'm truly thankful for the school district for taking a focus on this issue because as a student myself, I have been affected. I was affected by this pandemic from going from virtual and integrating back to in-person for my junior year. It's been interesting. And so I am thankful for this focus on this issue. And I did have a question. Um, we spoke about speak agent and I saw that it was on under the category for middle school. And I wanted to know if that was expanded for high school elementary or would be because I think that's an amazing opportunity for our ESOL students to integrate into their classes and actually learn, which is what they're there to do. And so I would have like that question answered. And if you'd have to get back to me with that, that'd be thankfully appreciated. 
Um, board member Boozer Struther, I did want to add some feedback when it came to Canvas. Um, as a student myself and hearing from my peers, um, it's been mixed emotions. Um, a lot of students preferred Google Classroom, um, but at the end of the day, I think if we don't learn to adapt, then we're never gonna achieve that world-class education that we want. And I think that was the vision when it came to Canvas. And so I personally like the new platform and I'm still learning, but I think that we're all by 2022 should be able to use it fully. So just wanna add to that and thank you. Thank you, <clears throat> board member Thomas. Yeah, I want to also just offer my thanks to Dr. Goldson, Dr. White, Dr. Coley for your hard work in this detailed presentation. Um, and I just wanted to echo the uh, comments from my colleagues, Ms. Mickens-Murray and uh, Ms. Adam Stafford, just around um, wanting to be able to track and, and see the outcomes here. Um, you know, these, these look like some really great resources and opportunities. And I also recognize that not all of them can be can be tied to a, a specific quantitative output or goal, but it would just be really helpful for um, us to track as a board and then to also be able to, to brag about um, how this has specifically um, uh, improved learning outcomes and uh, to tie it to some specific numbers. So just would love to see that, um, but thanks again for your hard work. Board member Williams. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, first, I'd like to say, Dr. Golson, this is an amazing plan. It is uh, definitely hitting all the points that we're trying to hit as a board to show, to finally, well, to become a school of excellence, a school system of excellence. And I just want to thank the staff members because I know that this takes a lot of work. I know that you all were going a certain way before the pandemic and had to pivot and deal with the learn learning loss so I can understand the challenges that you face. The, the one thing that I, um, I am very excited to see is that we are taking advantage of the things that came out of the pandemic, in particular, the use of technology, the ability for our students to go home and continue practicing what they learned in school, to be able to come back the next day and ask teachers specific questions on where they fall short, I think is great, and so I, I, I appreciate that recognizing the that there is a learning loss and although some students did excel and do well in the pandemic we know that there are some kids that did not do as well so that this seems to uh, um to approach and to support helping those kids that had learning loss the discussion around supporting our students and the parents as we move into the new way of of using the new technology, the new systems, I think it's definitely something that we want to do to make sure parents, because even I as a parent, I'm challenged with some of the, all the different uh, apps that we're using, all the different programs to be able to offer opportunities for parents to, to get some support, to have maybe training videos or things like that would be helpful so the parents can look at it at their convenience versus having to come and attend an event. Um, even if it's virtual. And to just uh, piggyback on what my board colleague Mickens Murray mentioned about monitoring and tracking success. I think since I've been on the board, we've, been, we've added um, goals in our budget. And I think that if we can sort of tie those goals back to the strategic plan, then we're able to at least take the opportunity and look at where we've come and how far we've come from where we are today every year in the budget. So that when we're looking at the budgets between now and 2026, we can see where we have hit the target, we can see where we're going in the right direction, and we can see where maybe we need to add additional funding or rethink what we're doing, and that will give us the ability to do our job of oversight. When we do the budget, we look at those successes and possibly failures where we have to rethink how we do our plan. And with that in mind, I would love to see us take a pulse of where we are today so that when we come back to the next year, we can see are we moving in the right direction? Because we recognize that when we thought about where we plan to be in 2021, way back in 2019, we know we're not there. 
and we know we can't change what happened the last 19 months, but what we can do is take stock in where we are today and then measure, you know, take measurements every so often to see that we're going in the right direction. So I'd love to see us take a pulse of where we are. And although I'm always challenged with the fact that when we say this is the third grade class, two years from now they're in fifth grade. So we have to follow the data with the cohort so that we know if we are staying on target. So again, I just, I am just so appreciative of all the work that you all took to come up with this strategic plan, and I think we're headed in the right direction. Thank you, Dr. Golson. Thank you. Uh, Board Member Murray. Thank you, Dr. Miller. Um, Dr. Golson, I really want to commend your team, um, particularly Dr. White, um, for your leadership around the science of reading. Um, I think that it's no secret that it takes a lot of courage to forge a new path like that and to really rethink um, how we're doing literacy from the ground up from the moment students um, enter our school buildings. Um, specifically, the letters training that you've rolled out has gotten rave reviews across our school system. Um, when I read about introducing decodable readers in your presentation, um, those are really huge shifts that are going to pay off greatly for our kids. Um, I wanted to ask about the, the tutoring. Thank you for providing this information. In terms of Book Nook and the, the one after Reading English Language Arts Foundational Skills, are these live? tutoring programs okay and I, I understand you know I'm really happy honestly with the, the number of students served because you know it really only is tutoring when it's three or four or less students um, and that's that's really critical to that model working um, what are going to be the the metrics or outcomes that we're using to evaluate the effectiveness for those early literacy tutoring programs do we have a particular assessment or I was writing them down. I'm sorry. You were no waiting worries. for us to respond. If, if you know now, if not, that's okay. Dr. Wayne. Yes. So what we did for each company is we worked with the company to talk about what shows growth, how much time a student would need to be in a platform with fidelity to show growth. And so that looks different for everything. So for each company, where's the starting point? And if a, if a child was to participate, whether it be six months, six weeks, four months, where, what would be the anticipated growth? And so that way we can look at a child's beginning and end to see if they've met it. First off, we would have to look at bands. What was the fidelity? So did you come, if it was 25 sessions, were you participating in all 25 sessions? Or were you in at least 20% of the sessions? Or you only came to one and then what growth was made and then determine that based on what the company says is evidence. Because remember we did research and evidence based, so all of them had their measure of what de determines growth. So we have a list of all of those things. And for each program, they have baseline data in order to monitor where they started and where they moved to. Great, thank you. My last follow up on that, how, how soon do you think you'll have kind of some first round of preliminary data on those programs? So for each program, it varies. For example, we could tell you for Book Nook, we knew from using it in the spring before we even moved to summer that students at a certain grade had not declined in their reading level if they had participated 80% of the time. So each one varies. Um, as Dr. White shared earlier, we have to report out on monitoring of every last one of the tools that we use. So when we finish compiling that, that's Doug Strader's shop, we'll put it in a report and provide it to everyone. Okay, thank you. Definitely looking forward um, to seeing that. And um, really, you know, seeing the science of reading in print in your presentations, it's a huge morale boost. I, mean, I, I immediately emailed many members of our work group who are really going to be overjoyed to see um, those words come in from you all um, tonight. So thank you again so much for your work. Any more co comments? Thank you. Again, thank you, team. Board Member Burroughs. Uh, good evening, everyone and colleagues. Um, I had some, uh, I guess, some questions about the different tiers, uh, tier one, tier two, tier three. Um, it would be helpful to know exactly how many students are in each of those tiers uh, and how we track each of those students. If the goal is to get students who are tier three into tier two, then tier two into tier one, which, you know, what intervention where those tier, and I know you went over the interventions, but which intervention um, will you employ for a tier two student to get them to tier one? 
and being able to track that, I think, would help uh, the board uh, and you uh, determine which interventions work best uh, and what interven which interventions work best for which type of student, because not everything works for everybody. Um, and I think uh, us being able to track that and see that data would be really helpful uh, because, you know, right now, I'm not, I'm not exactly sure how many students are in each category and, and maybe you're tier one in uh, reading but not tier one in math, right? I, I guess some, for, for further clarity around that, um, I think would be helpful. And just to provide clarity around when I spoke about tier one, two, and three, it's almost like an RTI model, so response to intervention. Mm -hmm. Tier one is not about the individual students, it's about the level of instruction you're receiving. So tier one is everyone gets the same thing. When you identify that everyone's getting the same thing and you have students who may need additional support, you start going beyond the tier. So that's more about in, in, um, instruction. Now when we start picking students, for our tutoring program, what we do is we look at whatever benchmark data. So for example, we might say the first unit math might determine the students that's going to go into the math tutoring for grades four and five. We may look for a particular band of students very tr strategically on if they're in the 30th percentile, that band, and then focus on them and give them intensive to see if it helps. So that's where we start looking at how we pick students for tutoring, is we go to where the need is and we look at what bands they're in based on certain assessments in that content. Well, that's really helpful. I think mm -hmm. that was the piece that maybe I got a little um, you know, confused sure, on. Sure, no problem. I think I have a similar condition to Morgan McQueen <laughs> at times. I uh, told you, I say it's a lot. I say, hey, I'm about to say a lot. <laughs> so I understand. But no, I appreciate you breaking that down for me. And we'll put it back in writing as well. Okay, yeah, no, it would be helpful to know um, based off of your preliminary assessment, what the learning loss impact is for the school district for these students uh, with those current benchmarks and then being able to track quarterly or however you decide that it's best, you know, best appropriate to track that so that we can see as a board and the public the progress that we're making as a school system uh, with, with the data. Yep. And Dr. Strait is almost completing that um, learning loss document. We're almost done. Cool. Thank you very much, and I thought that was a, a great presentation. I'm, you know, I'm really um, appreciated the additional advancements in the mental health category as well. Um, this pandemic has had a, an extraordinary impact on a lot of people mentally with the high unemployment rate um, and the, our students not being able to interact with mandatory reporters. So, we, of course, we saw the decrease in um, you know, child abuse reports, but we know that it was occurring. You know, all of those impacts um, definitely uh, create the conditions where the advancements in the mental health uh, areas is so important. So I definitely want to highlight that and appreciate that. Thank you. Thank you, board members. Next, we will move to the um, governance of uh, second reader unfinished business. Dr. Golson, would you please introduce item 5.1? Yes. Item oh, 5. Oh, excuse me, Dr. Golson. Oh, I've sorry. just been made aware that Board Member Queen had another comment. Thank you so very much, yeah. Sorry, I wanted round two. Um, so my next comment is, and I, and I noticed you just said that was how did, how did you pick the students for the um, assessment and for the tutoring so you guys are and just for clarification you guys are the one that's picking it so i'm just curious is it done equally across districts across the board is it low performing schools or how are we choosing them i know dr Gosen said she's going to get back um with some of the questions and um, my next thing is i saw up there about 140 um, mental health support workers i'm just wondering are we using these to help with the bullies and the people who are being bullied, um, the people who may want to be a little bit third of the gangs. How are we using these mental health professors when kids are getting in trouble with the fights? Are we taking the time instead of suspending them and taking the time and maybe forcing them to go see a therapist or a mental health specialist within our school period um, to get some help? Because maybe some of them just need some extra love and some extra attention. So I'm wondering how are we using these 140 mental health specialists 
And um, last but not least, um, we know our scholars did have a loss. Um, and not only that, we lost some of our scholars, which was very important. Um, and our job is to really to help the scholars to be the best they can be, sometimes not be the best that we want them to be. And I think we need to understand that because sometimes we have expectation of how we want people to be, but people can only be the best that they can be. And we must remember that um, because I believe this school year, some of our seniors got lost because teachers were trying to make them the, and um, be something that they were not. So we have to understand that our scholars and our students and people are individual, and sometimes they can only be the best that they can be, not what we expect them to be. So I just wanted to make sure that we remember that because we've lost too many students um, because we want them to be something that they're not, and we have to accept our students and our scholars for the way they are with their attitudes and all the other things they come with. They're not going to come a certain way with certain, um, certain, I just say, certain way of speak and certain knowing how to respect because they all wasn't taught that. And so we have to be accepted of them and stop trying to change them. And then once we judge them, um, some of our teachers, and I think that's one of the things Dr. Ghostin we need to look at to see how many students have we've lost because of teachers not grading them properly because maybe they didn't like the attitudes or the way of our scholars because we have to realize that they can only be the best that they can be, not what we expect them to be. Thank you. Thank you, Board Member Queen. Any did I miss anybody for the second round? Now we'll move forward with the uh, governance second uh, reader and finished business. Dr. Golson, would you please introduce item 5.1? Yes, item 5.1 requires board approval of the fiscal year 2022 comprehensive maintenance plan as a second reader. Second. It has been moved and second that <clears throat> we approve the F FY 2022 Comprehensive Maintenance Plan. Is there any discussion? Board Member Ahmed. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I do have a couple of questions and comments, so I'll go through them as quickly as I possibly can. I see, uh, Mr. Fawcett, you're probably holding, down, holding it down for the team uh, when it comes to the maintenance and plant operations um, plan that's here. but. Uh, a couple of comments. I am very excited to hear about the success of the student apprenticeship program that you mentioned in there. And I also saw that you briefly mentioned working with the Maryland Department of Labor to try and get an internal program for trades helpers, which is also great. Um, and so I wanted to talk about goals. For me, in my head, what a ideal bold goal would be, would be uh, in the next five to 10 years, uh, we have 50% of the maintenance and plant operations force coming through these programs. In my, in my head, that's a bold goal and that's a great goal to have. So my question to you is, what are the goals for expansion of these programs in the short term and the long term so we can reach bold goals like that? So thank you for that question, board member, man. And I just want to say, first of all, that uh, Mr. Stefanelli had an emergency uh, family obligation. He couldn't be here, so he wanted to express his apologies for that. But yes. Our, our goal definitely is to uh, long term to see if we can uh, grow, grow our employees in house from our student population. This was the whole uh, focus of the program, the CTE and building services got together, which is why we developed the program. Uh, in terms of numbers, those numbers haven't been established, but as you know, sometimes uh, our internal maintenance positions are hard to fill because in terms of uh, competitiveness, sometimes with the outside labor organizations um, at the beginning we're not as competitive so we realize that number one provide our students opportunity number one for career and technical in, uh, uh, education to get on hands experience and then to automatically be employed when they get out so it's a win-win for for all of us thank you mr Fawcett or dr Fawcett sorry um, and so just know I'm very supportive of the expansion of these programs and if there's anything that the board can do to help in that regard please let us know um, the other question I had, I saw on page nine that the maintenance and, and plant operations um, has been managing capital projects since 2017, and that the number of managed projects by that team has slowly increased over the years. And so I have a huge concern with that. Um, the maintenance and plant operations team is essentially responsible, as you know, for the day-to-day -day responsibilities and emergencies when it comes to fixing our crumbling infrastructure. And so my question is, why are those team members taking time away from that important responsibility to then manage capital projects, which should be handled by the capital, uh, 
programs department? So, so it, it's, it's twofold. Uh, number one, a lot of the projects that the maintenance handles for the capital uh, department are the smaller in scale projects, things like uh, uh, parking lot pavements, generator replacement, things of those natures. But this, I think, directly uh, correlates to our agent facilities and the amount of those smaller projects, whether it be um, uh, increasing at, at different schools, um, it became a, a, at a level where we did realize that maintenance couldn't handle those, so we actually have uh, PMs uh, who are contracted through CIP who do handle those projects. And they're, they're particularly project managers for those projects. Most of those projects that happen with CIP, whether they're internal or external, are contracted out, as most CIP work is. Oh, thank you for that, Dr. Fursett. I, I, my concern is really that, you, and you know, the maintenance support or the maintenance need is so great that I feel like what, if there are folks that are doing this job, we need to let them go and, and do, the th do the job, right? Fix the thing um, and be out on our schools to be able to do that work. So, so, let, so um, let me be clear, our, in, mm -hmm. our internal force does not work on those projects. Okay. They are, they are contracted out, but they are managed through PMs that are contracted by CIP. Okay, all right, thank you for that. Um, I also okay. noted in the document that um, there were 901 preventative work orders and 9,791 corrective work orders from fiscal year 21 that were not completed. That was page 25 to 26. That's a lot. Um, I know that we were in such a great place before the pandemic. You had like less than 35, less than, th I think it was like 34 were outstanding work orders. And so how do we get to this place where we have so many outstanding now? What's the plan to try and mitigate that? Well, we have to remember that was during the heart of the uh, pandemic, FY21. Our maintenance staff was for a significant amount of time was on a every other week schedule. Uh, so you, you also notice that uh, some of the per, uh, uh, per employee uh, number of work orders completed, uh, it actually expanded a little bit. And that's simply about time on task. Okay, thank you, Dr. Fawcett. Um, I also wanted to note that at a previous board me meeting, we were discussing the capital budget. Um, and, uh, you know, there were some projects that were marked as substantially complete, but they didn't have all the punch lists completed um, before the final closure of the project. So my question is how many folks or, or, or how many um, uh, issues with our infrastructure are we trying to resolve um, that should have been completed uh, through the punch list process by uh, developers. Uh, I'm just trying to get a gauge for how much our internal team is trying to work to cover a gap that may be uh, in our process. Uh, I mean, it, it'd be hard for me actually to quantify that in a, in a simple sentence, but, but know that uh, our staff does uh, hold our contractors to uh, the standard of uh, completing punch lists. Um, it, it, I guess it would be interesting to try to, to actually see um, how it correlates, but I don't believe it's a large scale. Okay, thank you. Um, and then one, one request for follow-up item. Your time is up. Okay, I'll wait you for um, round two. Thank you. Would you put it in writing to them, please? Yes, this was the follow-up request. Board member Queen. Okay, I can wait for round two. Thank you. Board member Queen. Thank you so very much. Um, the little thing that came up. But maintenance is so important to me, you guys, um, especially within our schools. And um, thank you guys so very much for all you do with maintenance. But um. I just have a couple of questions because I'm trying to understand maintenance a little bit. Um, when I went to school and I know it was years ago, I'll, and we call them janitors, I know y'all call them something else now, but our custodial staff did everything. But I noticed um, the maintenance we have now, they don't do everything. I mean, when you ask who cut the grass or who do the plumbing, we have all these different people. Is there a way, Dr. Gosen, can we get a list of what our custodial staff do? And I think that would kind of help with some of these questions or why are we paying all of these other people to do different things, not so much if people aren't doing their jobs as um, board member. I mean, it's just that it seemed like the job titles have changed and what is expected, because um, growing, growing up, I mean, a maintenance was like the plumber, the maintenance was the electrician, maintenance did everything, but it doesn't seem like um, in the school system lately, I've noticed y'all for maintenance is definitely not like apartment complex maintenance, because my maintenance man, when I lived in the apartment, they did everything. So I just think maybe if we had a little more clarification of what our staff do, we'll understand that a little better. Thank you so very much. Uh, board Member Valentine. Um, again, thank, thank you, uh, Dr. Forsett, um, for answering these questions. This is sort of a follow-up 
Um, we had a similar conversation with Dr. Uh, Cadet a few years ago about really trying to encourage parents um, to think about our CTE program as a potential option uh, moving into high schools. And one of, the one of the points that came up was how we reframe CTE in a way that highlights the entrepreneurship side of, of the careers. And about Dr. Um, Cadet mentioned that there would be some change in the curriculum to add that to CTE. I referenced that my, my, my barber drives a Tesla. Um, and this idea that parents steering their children into certain uh, careers um, without fully understanding the power of uh, that career leading to entrepreneurship and but all the skills it takes, supply chain management, hiring, um, uh, all the things that go into running a small business. Uh, is that something that has been implemented or in the process of implementing the curriculum for CTE to include those skills necessary to open your own business? Yes, it's an entrepreneurship course that's in our career pathways, in all of our career pathways. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I had a couple of follow-up item requests uh, for administration. Um, I know, oh, oh, I'm sorry. Uh, Madam Chair, I will hold. I see there are other folks for first round. You can go on. Okay, thank you. Um, the follow-up item request that I had, I saw in the document that we do mm -hmm. comprehensive annual building site evaluations for each building, um, as well as roofing inspections every six months and asbestos every three years. Uh, I would love to see those most recent reports um, provided to the board just so that we can get a better understanding of where we are with maintenance and plant operations and advocate accordingly uh, to whatever higher authorities we can. Um, and then the other item I just wanted to share with colleagues is I will plan to, I am plan on voting in support of this plan. I understand that this is also going to be discussed in the OBAFA committee meeting. Thank you so much to the chair of that committee and the vice chair of that committee um, for discussing that item. And if there are any amendments that come from there, I'm more than willing to, to hear what folks have discussed based upon that. Um, but overall, um, I'm very appreciative of the work of the maintenance and plant operations team. Um, I know that in the report you've noted that we have 36 vacancies so far. I hope that we can fill them quickly. Um, and if you, uh, my last question here is, if do you have a plan in order to try and fill those vacancies as of uh, current? Yeah, we continue to work uh, very closely with HR. Uh, to, to hold job fairs specifically uh, for certain positions. Once again, uh, on, the, on, the, on the professional side and the maintenance side, uh, we, we are in competition with uh, the private sector, uh, with the labor unions, but we, we aggressively try to fill those positions as quickly as possible. Thank you so much. And thank you, Dr. Fassett, for all the work of your team. It doesn't go unnoticed. And I'm always glad when I know that a maintenance person is coming to, to help a school, um, uh, a school environment that, that is, is struggling. Um, to get, to get those things fixed. So I appreciate that. Uh, please send our regards to Mr. Stefanelli as well and the rest of the team. Thank you. Thank you. Board Member Williams. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, Dr. Fawcett, um, we, we typically have some challenges with um, work orders and um, the timing in which it gets done. <coughs> Can you talk to us about the staff size and maintenance? So it, it, it's twofold. Um, there, there are all, always areas that we, you know, would like to have more staff just uh, based on, we, I mean, we're a school system that has 237 facilities, as you know, uh, that, that's buildings. Um, uh, the average age of our buildings, of course, is somewhere around 40 years old, so we, we struggle with uh, approximately $2 billion maintenance uh, uh, def deferment. Uh, but, you know, I. I I don't want anyone to think that, you know, staff, more staff will actually, you know, correct all the problems. It's bigger than that. We chase both sides of the, of the, of the pendulum, you know, um, needing capital dollars to invest in, in new construction, but also uh, maintenance dollars to keep up with the new construction. And they go and to keep up with the, the lack of new construction at a certain, and they go hand in hand. Um, I, I believe our staff size is, is adequate. Um, and we, we do our best to get the job done. Thank you. Thank you for that. Um, and thank you for mentioning that, that, that our staff doesn't only work in the buildings, the school buildings, they work in the 
bus lots, the offices, and everywhere around. The, the other part of that conversation is around how the work orders are processed and the rate in which we get work orders. In the summertime, of course, we have less work orders because we are able to do the maintenance. And then, <coughs> excuse me, during the school year, we may get more. So can you talk about the process and sort of the ebbs and flows of the rate in which we get um, work orders and how they are handled? Well, the, the work, work orders come in twofold. Number one, they, as, as, as work orders come in, we try, we try to get them done in, in the fashion that they come in. But as with any other uh, organization, emergency work orders come through and things move to the top of the priority list. Um, also, it's about what type of work orders. Um, meaning if you, uh, typically in a in shop like uh, HVAC, uh, we get a lot more work orders than we may get in, a, in like a paint shop or a ground screw. Um, so they're prior to us based on number one, when they come in, and number two, um, the, the status or the emergency type of situation that the, that the work order presents itself. Thank you for that. And I understand that this plan is, was um, prepared during, you know, a little while ago. We're contending with a lot of shortages in supplies. We have many boats that are out there waiting to go through the ports. And I know that that is going to be a challenge when getting some of the supplies. You mentioned already that you, you believe our staffing is adequate for the number of buildings that we have and I guess the average amount of work orders that we get on a daily basis. But when we have those changes in weather and things like that, that is when we have the, the I think a higher level of maintenance issues when we're going from winter to summer and summer to winter. We have more calls because we're changing the, um, that how we um, condition the air. So I know that we have those challenges. Do you foresee any, uh, any major changes in this capital program based on what we're seeing in the supply chain, what we, what we contend with with our capital budget, or our maintenance budget? Well, I think ultimately we're dealing with uh, the same type of situation that many other school districts are or just businesses in general. Um, there's been an elongated process on, on ordering parts, you know, so some of our delays are directly related to being able to get uh, s certain products in in a timely fashion. Mm -hmm. uh, in, on, on some uh, HVAC equipment where we were used to dealing with maybe a six week turnaround on ordering a uh, piece of equipment, it's turned into maybe 20 weeks. Mm -hmm. uh, so, but, but those challenges are challenges, like I said, it's not germane to Prince George's County. It, it, it's, it's something that we're dealing with based on the, the, the climate we're in with the uh, pandemic. Thank you for that. And I assume that because our schools, our infrastructure is really old, some of those parts may be harder to get because of yeah, the timing some, in which we get things yeah, delivered. Yeah, in some cases we can't even we can't even get certain parts, but mm -hmm. there are companies out there that, that that will actually build the part for us. Mm -hmm. uh, so we weigh that in terms of um, time constraints. Sometimes it, it, it's a lot more expensive to go out and 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 buy a new uh, apparatus, whatever that may be. But at the same time, we balance that between how how long will it take us to get part, to get the part. Uh, how much would it cost us to put some sort of temporary situation uh, in place until we get the park? But we make those kind of decisions on a daily basis with, with uh, all of those aspects uh, in play. Thank you. Thank you, <clears throat> Board Member Williams. Board Member Adam Stafford. Thank you, and thank you for your presentation. I just had a couple of quick questions. Um, I noticed in the report that over the last several years, the work order completion rate um, has grown. And I, I know that the percentage that I read was that last year you all were at 18% completion, I believe. I didn't know if you all had set some goals for this year um, in terms of completion rate. And if you don't have that on hand right now, that's fine. But I just wanted to know if you all had a goal for this year, seeing as you were able to double it um, last year. Also, uh, in terms of schools that have this, have seen increased enrollment. So I know, particularly in my district, I know that I've talked to uh, school leaders just about, you know, that they have had an increase of like 100 students and therefore they need more maintenance staff. And so I didn't, I wanted to know if there were plans for um, maybe temporary reallocation of custodial staff to support in schools that have an increased uh, amount of students. Um, and then also, I, 
I don't know like where retrofitting fits into this conversation. I know that uh, my colleague has the climate action work plan and, and I know that retrofitting is a part of some of that preemptive strategy of making sure that older buildings um, can handle a lot of the increased um, severe weather that we'll be having that will undoubtedly like cause us to have more maintenance needs. And so I don't know if you could speak to that a bit or if that's more under capital improvement. So thank you. Uh, to, answer, to answer your first question, uh, the metrics upon uh, completion days in terms of work orders, it's, it's always one of our job targets <laughs> in maintenance to, to have a reduction in, in, in that field. Um, your second question. It's also in our budget guide. Yeah. Your, your second question. She had three. Schools that have had increased oh, enrollment. The temporary custodians. Yes, ma'am. We do. We do have that in our budget, and you know, once again, one of our one of our, one of our biggest issues there is that we have the FTEs, we have the temporary positions. It's, it's really about finding the employees right now. We're, we're struggling um, in certain areas, as you know, bus drivers, uh, food service workers, and uh, custodians. Just out of curiosity, do you have partnerships with local um, trade trade unions that possibly? Is, oh, okay. Yes, ma'am. All right. And then uh, I think I asked about retrofitting. Um, so, so I'm I'm not very clear on exactly what your question is, but um, I just, could expand um, on it. If yeah, just uh, sort of um, ensuring that older buildings uh, have more up to date like when, so, you know supplies so, and windows so that you know okay. as we so have more rain more our, snow more severe okay, heat. i got it down okay, in terms sorry. of <laughs> so if you look at our education facilities master plan and our modernization plan that's part of uh, what we look at as a whole so you know our our schools are, are broken into different tiers and we address those issues as they come but that that modernization plan is a cap was on the capital side more than the maintenance side yes ma'am thank you thank you Board Member Harris. Okay. Thank you. Are there any more comments? Then we will move to take the vote. Uh, Ms. Ellis, would you call the roll? I didn't understand. Mrs. Adam Stafford? Yes. Mrs. Ahmed? Aye. Ms. Booster Strother? Yes. Mr. Burroughs? Aye. Mr. Saron Ruiz? Oh. Aye. Sorry. Mr. Harris? Aye. Ms. Mickens Murray? Aye. Mr. Montero? Yes. Mr. Murray? Aye. Mrs. Queen? Definitely aye. Mr. Thomas? Aye. Mr. Valentine? Aye. Mrs. Williams? Yes. Dr. Miller? The ayes have it. <clears throat> the comprehensive, the 2022 comprehensive maintenance plan has been approved. Uh, point uh, six, follow up items, 6.0, follow up items. The follow up items from September 2nd board work, board work session have been posted on board docs. Um, before we move into, I, I left something off earlier in reference to um, my com well comments, and uh, we need to let the public know that the board voted earlier to uh, retain the uh, legal counsel services of Mr. Andrew Nussbaum, and I wanted to give him an opportunity to uh, greet the board. This is the chair's privilege. <laughs> Thank you, Madam Chair. I appreciate that. Um, I'm very happy to be um, back in Prince George's County. I was here many, many years ago, and uh, I really appreciate the opportunity to work with the Board of Education uh, on an interim basis, doing both appeals and, and any other matters that may uh, come before you as, as the Board of Education. And thank you all very much for the opportunity to do so. Thank you. Now we'll move to uh, 7.1 motion to confirm actions taken in executive session. 
So oh, I didn't see your hand. We just finished that. You just put it back in writing to us. So the follow-up responses, I'm assuming she did not, We she needs us to elaborate on the responses or something? Yeah, so then what you do is you just provide a follow-up to us and then we will respond again. Could very well have not been the question that was written down. That's why tonight I took notes so that I will make sure I got the right question. <clears throat> Thank you, Dr. Golson. Moving on to motion to confirm actions taken in executive session. Motion uh, and second to confirm action. The following actions were to discuss personnel matters regarding the appointment and employment of certain employees. So moved. Second. It has been moved and second to confirm actions in executive session. Uh, roll call, please. Oh, any discussion? Roll call. Mrs. Adam Stafford. Aye. Mrs. Ahmed. Aye. Ms. Booza Strether. No. Mr. Burroughs. Aye. Mr. Saron Reeves. Aye. Mr. Harris. Aye. Mrs. Mickens Murray. No. Mr. Montero. No. Mr. Murray? Aye. Mrs. Queen? Aye. Mr. Thomas? Aye. Mr. Valentine? No. Mrs. Williams? No. Dr. Miller? No. Motion carries. May I have a motion to adjourn? So moved. So moved. Second. It has been moved and set second to approve, um, <laughs> to adjourn. Um, any discussion? Good night, everyone, and thank you for your time. Uh, point of order, Madam Chair, attendance. we have to vote. We need to vote. All in favor. All in favor. Aye. 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 Any oppositions? Good night.